Listen, I, wrote a, I drew a little bit of a, of a map up here, and I guess I'll take the microphone with me so that you can hear, but I, I didn't complete my map. So this is the, where Israel would be, right? And you could just say that this is the Mediterranean Sea. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just put Med Sea for short, okay? This is where Egypt would be. I don't know that all this is real important, but this is the Euphrates and the Tigris rivers. Now listen, I want, I want to put these maps up here because we're about to get into some end time studies before, it ha before it's over with. We're going to spend, God only knows how many months we're going to be discovering and uncovering and digging into the, the, the biblical term is called eschatology. That's a fancy way of saying the study of end time events. And we're going to be digging into Daniel and we're going to be digging into to the book of Revelation. Now, how many people have Facebook? Go ahead and raise your hand if you have Facebook. I'm not asking you whether you're active on it, but well, you know, or what you post on there. But I see that the large people in the crowd have Facebook. I understand. People out there, if you have Facebook, listen, I had Danielle, I don't have Facebook anymore. You know why? Because I couldn't act right on Facebook. I'm just going to be honest with you. I had to call everybody in the mama out. Oh, Lord, I had to fix everybody on Facebook. And, like, that ain't reality, right? So I just said the best thing for me to do is shut this bad boy down because I'm acting like a fool. And that was about six years ago, and I don't miss it that much. Anyway, I asked Danielle to put on Facebook that video. How many people have watched that video that I asked Danielle to put on Facebook on the church page? Yvette, one, two, three, four, five. Okay, it's a five-hour-long video. Now, that's up to you whether you want to watch it or not, but I'm calling it a precursor class to our study of end-time events. Okay, now what this video is about, I'm just going to tell you, and some people may not be interested in it, so I'll just give you a little cliff note, and that way if you're not interested, you don't have to watch it. But the, according to this story, this is a, a gentleman that was from Australia that was in a band, and he won some, some show in, in Britain. Uh, was it F F Factor? Fear Factor. Fear, no, it wasn't Fear Factor. It was some X Factor. He won this thing. Okay, well, so he was in some rock band and he won this X Factor thing over there. Well, this is his story. I don't know if he was driving the vehicle or if he was asleep in the vehicle, but he said, I was awakened by the slightest whisper of an angel. And when he woke up, his car was heading 120 kilometers an hour for a cement wall, and he just barely diverted disaster. And from that, he got saved. Now, this is the crazy thing. He was a 33rd degree Mason before. Wow. The whole five hours of this video is him revealing and exposing the occultic world and how it's shrouded in Freemasonry. All right. And really that Freemasonry, let me just say this, is nothing more than a tool or a vehicle. There's many vehicles, but a vehicle of the enemy that he's been traveling in as he's been bringing his age old occultic doctrines and spreading them upon the world. Now, the reason that I made this video what I would call a prerequisite to the end time study is so that you would understand what's already out there in the world and has been there in the world because many of these things will come to life in the scripture as we begin to unveil it. Now, the only reason I'm even bringing any of that up is, is because I have a map up here and while I have the map up, I want to go ahead and start kind of like by the time I'm done with this, you'll probably feel as though you've been inundated with a history lesson and chronology and things like that. But I hope in the end that you understand my whole purpose and is to allow you to see what the beast even is. And that's a big concept. What is the beast? What is the beast system? What is the Antichrist? What is this Mark thing? We're not even preaching about that this morning. All right? But what I want you to see is this. The story that we're going to be reading, you can actually put it up, Jonah chapter 1. I'm going to read the whole chapter of Jonah chapter 1. We're, so that we're going to be preaching on the study of Jonah. And really what I titled my message this morning was, uh, let's see what I put. But this makes sense to me. So that would be Jonah saying that. But this makes sense to me. Now, well, how do you equate that to your life? How does that work for you? Because when I, if I'm operating with my own natural mindset and I view the things of life and I see the world and how wicked the world is and, and you know I see all the things that are going on in life in general, then I can begin to imagine in my heart and my mind, but this makes sense to me. 
Even though God's word is saying something different, many times we find ourselves walking according to the beat of our own drum. And that's exactly what Jonah did. And we're going to dig into that in a moment. But in the meantime, I just want to make a, point, make a couple of points while we have this uh, map up here. So these two rivers are known as the Euphrates and the Tigris rivers. And this area has been called various things, whether it was called Babylonia, that's the whole region, okay? Babylonia, it was also called Shinar. All right, now, when we get into studying end time events, a lot of this, it starts in the garden, but then it moves to the Tower of Babel, right? And in the Tower of Babel, there was a man named Nimrod. We're going to study him in, great, in, in detail. We're going to talk a lot about him. The Bible says in Genesis chapter 10 that Nimrod began to build this whole land. This whole land of Shinar, this whole land, this city Nineveh that, that is mentioned in Jonah. All this land started with Nimrod in Genesis chapter 10. Now, i got to tell you something real quick. Timeline-wise, the, the Babel happens right after the flood. We don't really have good dates on this. I mean, we can kind of speculate, but we don't really have historical dating for when the flood took place. Or really when the Tower of Babel took place, okay? But we do know that Abraham, and the way we know is, is that even historically over there in Iraq, they had a museum with all kind of pre, they called it pre-Abrahamic artifacts. When Desert Storm happened, people ransacked the museum and they stole things that they called pre-Abrahamic articles and, and, and archaeological finds, okay? So what we do have is we have a time frame on Abraham, all right? Now, Abraham was the man, we're going to put him about 2000 B.C. Abraham was the man, you remember there was no nation called Israel. I know this is a little bit of a history lesson. I didn't plan on getting this deep, but we're here, so let's just go ahead and follow it through. Abraham was the man that God called out of modern-day Iraq. Now, the area where Abraham was called out of was somewhere down here that was called Ur of the Chaldees. All right. Now, if you didn't know this in the Bible, Abraham's father, his name was Terah. Abraham's father was a maker of idols. That's why God said, come out of your father's house and I will make you a great nation. I will bless those who bless you and I will curse those who curse you. If you do any kind of extra biblical studying on family idols, then there was an idol called a teraphim. Abraham's daddy's name was Terah. That's where that concept comes from. So Abraham's father was an idol maker. Now, what does that have to do with me in 2021, dude? Well, I'm going to tell you what it has to do with you. And it's going to also be in the text. Jonah tells us in the midst of his despair, people are looking to worthless idols. Now, i got to tell you something, church. People are still looking to worthless idols today. I'm not talking about the Mary statue that's in your neighbor's yard. Now, yeah, that could be. Absolutely, it could be. If you feel called by the Lord to go knock on your neighbor's door and say, hey, you got an idol in your yard. It's preventing you from properly seeing the Lord. If the Lord leads you to do that, that's fine. You, you go right on and do it. But it's bigger than that. What I want to establish with you here this morning is that an idol is anything that stands between you and God and prevents you from being able to focus your eyes properly on the Lord that sent his son Jesus to die on the cross for your sins. Oh, preacher, oh, I, don't, I don't know if I'm going to like where you're going. You probably won't. Because it's all those things that you like in your life that you hold on to. It's all the things that many times people in the modern church don't want to remain in a church that they're going to hear constantly that they're more connected to the world than they are the ways of the Lord. Secular music is like an idol in your life. What are you talking about? I'm talking about the music of the world is like, can be like an idol in your life. It turns your eyes and your focus off of God and it brings it back to the world and the ways of the world. If I like listening to songs that all they talk about is sexuality and doing drugs and drinking and my mind is stayed upon the ways of the world, then I'm not thinking about the things of God. And that doesn't just mean hip-hop. That's not just talking about rock and roll. That's talking about country music. 
Whatever it is, if it's taking and diverting my attention from God, the Holy One of Israel, listen to me, church, you were put here for a purpose. Your purpose is either to serve the Lord or to serve yourself. And when you serve yourself, in, a, in essence, you're serving the evil one without really realizing, oh, no, I'm not a devil worshiper. But he said to Eve, what did he say in the garden? In the day that you eat thereof, you shall not die, but instead you shall know, bling, and you shall become as God's. You're going you're gonna to serve yourself. You become the God. Just like he said, the Bible says about him in Ezekiel 36 and Isaiah 14, that you were created perfect in all your ways. You were full of beauty until, until the day that you said, I'm going to ascend above the throne of the Most High God. When that happened, he became an object that desired to be worshipped. And when we choose to go our own way, and to serve our own desires when they're contrary to the desires and the will of God in a way, we're serving the enemy and not serving God. Okay, hopefully that makes some sense. So whenever we get into these time frames, though, going back to this, about the time of Abraham in about 2000 BC, so you remember that the Tower of Babel is somewhere right in the middle of this, all right? And they believe that the Tower of Babel would have been somewhere around here. Can't really completely prove it for sure, but there's definitely some remains there. There's ancient philosophers that talked about, even Alexander the Great talked about the Tower of Babel. We have historical and archaeological finds that show us that this thing was something that was real. Now, why is it important to talk about the Tower of Babel? Well, we're going to get into that more as time goes forward. But that's where occultic worship was taking place. Now, if you go back and you watch that video, you're going to see this guy showing you all kinds of signs with the Freemasonry. He's going to show you the hidden hand, you know. He, they show you what they're doing with this hand, but it's, this is the hidden hand, okay. Or more, co more commonly, if you've been watching any kind of musical videos or even watch SpongeBob SquarePants for that matter, you see everybody doing this number here. Where they do the eye. And everybody knows about it now. It ain't nothing we don't know about. But you know what's sad is I used to, five, six years ago, I was going to the jail over there at Ashland. And I'd get up in the hatch hall and I'd start preaching to them. And they're like, I don't know about all this Jesus stuff. But I said, but you do know, I know that we do know something in common. We both served the devil at one point in time in our life. And you over here knowing, you know the Illuminati's real. You believe the Illuminati. Oh, yeah, 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 that stuff's real. And yet you still go home when you get out of here. You connect yourself to the garbage that they're infiltrating your heart and your mind with. And they're straight up telling you who they are and what their plans are and what they desire to do. And yeah, but man, it makes me feel good. I like to feel that beat down up in my bones. Okay, well, no, that's a problem, sir, ma'am. That's your flesh that wants to be interconnected to those things. And so all this stuff right here, all this pyramid stuff, don't take no snapshots and look the preacher like I'm just a nobody, so it don't matter anyway. <laughs> All those things that we see are all interconnected to this pyramid thing here, okay? And it all goes back to that Tower of Babel because they were reaching into the second heavens. What does that mean? They were reaching in and engaging spiritual entities in order to gain power and manifestations upon earth. That's why everything that you see, even in churches sometimes, come on somebody, work with me, is not always of the Lord. Yes, it's spiritual. Oh, you better believe it's spiritual. But it's not always the Holy Spirit. That's right. Is the point that I'm trying to make. Dude, you can see preachers doing some of these weird signs. I'm not, I don't have time to get into that. I'm just trying to give you a little bit of a background. So, listen. This is ancient. Between the flood and Abraham, Nimrod created this whole area. Now, we're going to fast forward a little bit because we've got to get to the time frame of where I want to be. But this Babylon, see at the time frame of Jonah, this, this nation Babylon, which comes later with King Nebuchadnezzar and Daniel. Y'all remember the story of Daniel? That's later. This is about 586 B.C. Okay? Well, so Jonah is about right here. This is the time frame I'm going to give it, about 700 B.C. All right? And during the time frame of Jonah, this is the world power. Assyria and Egypt. And Israel is kind of caught in between these two. You see that? 
These are the dominant powers. It's important when we get into the end time teachings that we're going to talk about that we can see these world powers and who they are because they're, co they're countries and they're entities that have from the beginning been against God and against the plan of God. So when you get to the book of Revelation and you see a seven-headed beast, you'll understand that it was connected to these countries that have had it out for God from the beginning and have just keep reinvigorating themselves, keep recreating themselves. That's what the beast is. The beast is a system. Yes, it will be interconnected to a legitimate man, but ultimately the beast is a system. It's a financial system. It's a government system. It's a religious system. Okay, I want you to understand that. But what we're talking about right now is, is, is we've got a story. And we're about to read Jonah chapter 1. Let me go ahead and get my Bible out. Old school trusty Bible. Hopefully I can remember how to find Jonah. I might not be able to. It's been so long since I turned the pages on. <laughs> oh, a Bible. It's a crying shame. All right, let's see here. Where are we at? 925. 925? You got the same book? You got the same book? Okay. All right, 925, she says. He's one of the minor prophets. All right, here we go. We got Book of Jonah. All right. So what else did I want to say about this before we get going? I wanted to say this, that this is the area about where Jonah, this is the, this is the area of Israel. So Jonah was a prophet in the northern kingdom, okay? And God tells him to go to this place here, right? To go to Nineveh to preach. And what Jonah does is instead, it says he goes down to Joppa and he buys him a ticket to go to a place called Tarshish. Now, the best that we can determine is that Tarshish was a city or an island or an area in deep into the Mediterranean Sea. But I, the main point that I wanted to get across to you is that, does it look like Jonah was going in the direction that God was asking him to do? No, he was going in the complete opposite direction of what God was asking him to do. Now, that can go for every little bitty aspect of our lives, amen, because God's word is in this book, and God is speaking to us, amen, and he's giving us direction on which way to go, and many times we find ourselves going in an opposite direction. Let's go ahead and read Jonah chapter 1, and it will give us somewhat of an idea of what we're looking at. All right, here we go. Now the word of the Lord came unto Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry against it, for their wickedness is come up before me. But Jonah rose up to flee unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord and went down to Joppa, and he found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare thereof and went down into it to go with them unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. But the Lord sent out a great wind into the sea, and there was a mighty tempest in the sea, so that the ship was like to be broken. Then the mariners were afraid, and cried every man unto his God, and cast forth the wares that were in the ship. That means the tackle, all the things that are connected to the sails and things of that nature to lighten it of them. But Jonah was gone down into the sides of the ship, and he lay and was fast asleep. So the shipmaster came to him and said unto him, What meanest thou, O sleeper? Arise, call upon your God, if so be that God will think upon us that we perish not. They were praying to every God known to man. Oh, somebody, there got to be one real God out there. And then they find Jonah sleeping, right? Pray to your God too, man. We need some help. And they said, everyone to his fellow, come and let us cast lots that we may know for whose cause this evil is upon us. So they cast lots and the lot fell upon Jonah. Now, I don't mean to stop, but I'm just this. I kind of just saw this right there. These Heathens. Now, I'm not picking on them. I'm just telling you. They didn't know God, right? You know what a heathen is, right? Somebody that doesn't know the one true God. 
These heathens had enough sense to know that this wasn't just some normal Eurycladon or some blue, some north, north, nor'eastern. Oh Lord, a nor'eastern's done come upon us. No, these are well. These men are very savvy when it comes to sailing. Something has happened in the midst of their life, and they got enough spiritual sense to know this isn't just some normal nor'eastern that just shows up out of nowhere. We're being judged. Something's going on in the midst of this situation and we are in a bind and we need to figure out what the problem is and we need to rid that problem out of our boat because we need some peace and some solace to take place in our life. <coughs> Verse 8. Then said they unto him, Tell us, we pray thee, for whose cause this evil is upon us? What is your occupation? And whence comest thou? Where, what, what do you do for a living and where are you coming from? What is your country and of what people are you? And he said unto them, I am a Hebrew and I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, which has made the sea and the dry land. Then were the men exceedingly afraid and said unto him, why have you done this? For the men knew that he fled from the presence of the Lord because he had told them. Then said they unto him, What shall we do unto you that the sea may be calm unto us? For the sea wrought and was tempestuous. That sounds like a pretty scary place to be. Anybody ever worked on a boat before? Everybody been on a boat before out in the Gulf? I've been, on some, I've been out there, you know, and, and it can be pretty rough, man. When them boats get bam and slamming down onto the water and Jerking ropes that are connected to the rigs and popping big old thick nylon ropes, dude. This is ugly. I'm not even gonna tell you what the say what the sailors look. I mean, everybody out there on the deck flopping around. Some people that aren't used to it throwing up all over the place. Oh, it's a mess. Trust me. And that's just the Gulf of Mexico. You know, I've been in the North Sea before, not on the water. Thank the Lord. But that's a whole nother ball game right there. Anyway, it's a mess. This is a mess. The sea was tempestuous and it wrought. It was angry.